Happy Mother's Day. Good morning. Good morning. It's already been a long day. <laughs> and out of absolute concern that my wife have a good Mother's Day, we're taking a nap this afternoon. <laughs> Okay, so we have a couple more Ask the Pastor questions. Uh, I actually have, I'm starting a queue now because I have enough that I'm not going to be able to get to each one each Sunday. So, Lori, yours will be next Sunday. So, I'm going to read the questions to you, and then I'll give my best shot in answering. What does it mean to be created in the image of God, and how has the fall affected us? That's a really good question. Imago Dei um, is Latin for image of God. Uh, Genesis 1 tells us that we were created in the image of God and um, in his likeness. Now, the Hebrew word for image and likeness is a similarity to, not an exact replica. Okay? Uh, there are some beliefs out there that say, oh yeah, we're God-like. No, we're not. God was never made out of the dust, we were. God breathed life into us. Uh, from the dust we come, to the dust we return. Okay? Um, there are three different views among uh, different parts of the church as to what this means. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? Quite honestly, I think all three of them have parts of it right. Okay? So I'm not going to support any one particular view, but uh, the three views are uh, representative. This view asserts that humankind possesses a formal nature that serves to represent God. This nature then possesses certain qualities, characteristics, or endowments they, that make humankind like God. So there are certain things about us just as we are that make us like God. I'm sure bald spot is one. <laughs> the second one is relational. Now, relational carries with it the same idea as representative, but it also carries it a little bit further. It insists that humans are most like God when it comes to their unique relational qualities. Okay? And this is kind of seen in the idea that, you know, we have husbands and wives and parents and children, and interpersonal relationships, okay? So it, it carries with it not just that we have within ourselves quality of, of God, but that we relate as God relates, okay? So the, the third idea is functional. This idea insists that it's not so much um, who you are, but what you do that makes you like God, okay? So th those are the three main ideas out there. What does Imago Dei, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? I think all three of them have very strong points. I think all three of them in and of themselves have weaknesses. I think they're all three supposed to work cooperatively together. Now, the second part of the question is how did the fall affect this? I can't answer that because I never saw what it was like before, okay? I, I have no idea if, if there was a certain attribute of Adam's in the garden that made him look more like God or act more like God or relate more like God than we do. So I can't really answer that. I think sin has completely corrupted what Imago Dei should be. But I believe when we see him face to face, we will understand. Okay? Um, so... There, in a nutshell, is what does it mean to be in the, created in the image of God, and how has the fall affected it? I can't really answer that, because I don't know what the first part really is. So, um, they didn't put a name on it. I will leave it up here for you. The second one, Miss Vivian. Miss Vivian and I have already had a discussion about this. Um, at what period of time did all the dinosaurs and saber-toothed tigers and mastodons, etc., Roam the earth. And when did the north and south poles reverse? Uh, was this before God recreated the earth in Genesis 1 or when? Okay, so 
This is what I believe. Uh, I believe God created the dinosaurs, the saber-toothed tigers, the mastodons, and everything else in the days of creation. I believe they existed after the ark. Now, how God fit them on the ark, I don't care. I, I don't. I know that they existed after the ark because when God is rebuking Job in the book of Job, he very clearly specifies two types of creatures, the behemoth and the leviathan, that, that man has tried to rationalize, okay, the behemoth is an elephant or a hippo. Read the description. That can't be. It's not going to be. Um, the Leviathan, I've heard, is supposed to be a crocodile. Yeah, no, not going to happen. Okay, read the description. God is explaining to Job something that Job could understand, something that was relational to Job. He said, can you do this to the behemoth or this to the Leviathan? Now, if Job didn't know what those were, that would have no meaning, would it? So it's my belief that they existed after the flood, and when did they die? Before me. <laughs> okay. Um, do I believe that there are some form of dinosaurs somewhere? Maybe. To be honest with you, I don't stretch my brain about that stuff. Because unless one shows up at my front door, I don't care. <laughs> okay. But the second part of the question was, was interesting. Uh, when did the poles reverse, north and south? And I'm assuming you were meaning the magnetic force field because of the poles. All the time. That's actually an ongoing event that happens regularly. Now, regularly meaning what? Some scientists say, oh, every 200,000 years, but we haven't had them for the last 600,000 years. Okay. So the first part just gave light to the second, or the second gave light to the first or something. Another scientist that, that I read said, oh, it happens about every 2,000 years, give or take. Now, we know in recent times, as far back as um, early 1800s, that the North Pole has moved on an average of about 50 kilometers a year. Okay? Uh, we have record of it being somewhere up uh, in the Alaska area, and it's moved, and they're saying that within 100 years or so, it'll actually move from North America over into Siberia. Now, the, what, what does that mean to us? Well, it depends who you read. Some people say, it's the end of the earth! You have, not unless God says so. Other people say, yeah, it doesn't really mean much of anything, except that your compass is going to get a little wonky, you know, if you live that long. Okay? Um, so, when did they reverse? Now, this is where things get really technical. Um, you can tell by the way the magma flows when it comes up out of a volcano as to which pole they're being pulled to, the iron ore inside of it is being pulled to, so that's part of how we know that the poles have been moving. Other parts are, uh, I guess somebody just, some elf picks it up and walks it over and sets it down. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't care. Um, but we do know that it has been ongoing with some regularity throughout the history of man. So um, there's that. I, I'll give that right to you. Okay, so, um, you know when I told you, ask the pastor, ask me stuff I know. Can we get a list of things you do know? It'll be a very short list. It would be very short. So, um, Mother's Day, I'm going to read... I'm going to read what I wrote, because if I try and do it off of my memory, um, you're in trouble. Um, we've had a, a very busy week. We're looking at another busy week next week, and as things get busier and busier, I tend to become more and more forgetful. My wife says it's because I think about more important things. We'll go with that. Um, she she kind of pointed out to me the other day, I asked what day was it like five times. <laughs> and she said, obviously you were thinking about more important things because um, you, you kept forgetting the day. So well, obviously I thought the day was important because I kept asking. <laughs> so I want to read to you, what does it mean to be a mom? Okay? Now this is from my perspective. 
Okay, so this is not all inclusive. This is from things that I've seen being a son, being a husband, being a grandfather, and watching my children raise their children. And so these are just observations that, that I've, I've made. You are the initial carrier and caregiver of your child through pregnancy. You are the receivers of the curse of Eve when you deliver those children. You continue in this curse as you rear your children, who are born with a nature that is, at its very core, self-centered, centered, and egocentric. You are the confident and first friend of your children. You hurt when they hurt, feel joy when they are happy, and are proud when they choose the right and mourn when they do not. You see them at their best and can even see them better than they see themselves. You stay up nights worrying when they are sick, tending to their needs with chicken soup, cool cloths, and popsicles. You willingly give up endless possibilities for yourself in order to create possibilities for them. You will gladly endure years of bad school music programs and peewee sporting events or ballet for their sake. You hope for them, cheer for them, love them and care for them, even when they are less than lovely. You watch as they grow, tending them carefully with thoughts for the future. You speak as the voice of a loving, heavenly father and show them the sacrificial love that is comparable only to our saviors. You do your best to shield them from the evils of the world and fret when they begin to venture out into it. Though you may long for the days of freedom, when your child is grown and moved out onto other things, you also fear that day, knowing it will bring a change in the very nature of your relationship. You look with anticipation and some anxiety on the future of your children, hoping that they will remember the lessons you have taught, fearing that they won't, and will have to learn through hardship just as you did. You would do just about anything to spare them that pain. And when that day comes, as you turn to them, you turn them loose and set them on the course of their life, they will always have a special place in their hearts for mom. But this is not all. Because all of these things only touch on what is really happening. See, God has placed his divine hand on you and entrusted you with one of the greatest responsibilities any person in the world or the history of the world has ever been given. Because your child is actually his child. And you are being given stewardship of something that God places incredible value on. So much value that he gave his only son for your child's eternity. And he has entrusted this unique creation of his into your care. He expects you to care for and lead and instruct his children with all of the love that only he could place in your heart. He expects you to know when to love by comforting and encouraging as well as by disciplining and exhorting. He expects you to lay a foundation such that your child will have every opportunity to come to know him. Even as Lois and Eunice taught Timothy the scriptures so that when Paul was preaching to him at Lystra, it was a combination of their faith and their diligence in teaching him that made him wise for salvation. Your children will look to you to see how they should live their lives, how they should enact, react to pressure and stress, temptation and trial. They will follow your example in establishing their priorities. Yes, God has entrusted you with great responsibility and at times it may seem overwhelming. The pressures of mothering may change from one season to another but they will never be truly gone because you will always be mom. God has never intended you to do all of this of your own strength. No, he is your strength. 
He has the strength to continue on with minimal sleep and colicky babies. Your refuge from the chaos of slumber parties, your peace during their teenage years, and your hope when they choose wrongly. Yes, being a mother has great responsibility and requires a lifelong devotion, but it is one of the highest callings God has gifted to mankind. So moms, thank you. I wrote intentionally because there were so many things going through my mind this week. I couldn't really establish what I wanted to say. I asked for prayer several times from a number of different people because I really want to lay out before you what God would say. And I don't want to cloud it with my own opinion. I want to encourage moms today. The price you pay is high. It shows physically in your body, the bags under your eyes, the hair that starts to change colors, the weariness in your bones. But all of that changes in an instant when your child makes you smile. All of it goes away. And God is well pleased. Sin has corrupted things and it's twisted so much. But I think in the love of a mother for a child, we see one of the things that is most pure. Most pure. And having been in the delivery room for every one of our children and getting Christy, seeing her going through the struggle, the labor, they call it labor for a reason, and then being able to take that newborn life and hold it and see her face light up. And she knows it's worth it. I, I can't even, I, I have nothing in my life that comes close to what she could feel there. She has a bond with our children that I will never have. God has established it that way. Moms and dads serve different purposes. But I want to encourage you moms, and I'm not talking just to biological moms, because my, my wife is mom to a lot more than just our five children. We have adopted many kids over the years, and she has had the opportunity to speak into their lives and bless them with the things that God has shown her, to be able to just hug someone when they needed a hug to sit and give a listening ear when somebody needed to talk. To just let them know that it's going to be okay. But God has laid an incredible task before you. Because see, it's not just looking to their physical needs or even their emotional needs. God has laid before you the task of rearing children that would know Him. And think of the raw material that you have to start with. The child is born thinking only of themselves. I cry, I get fed. I cry, I get held. I cry, I get changed. And then comes the time when they cry and you tell them, hey, you're old enough, stop crying. What? What? <laughs> what? Why would I stop? The rules have changed. No, no, no. And then comes in discipline and correction. <clears throat> and comes, should come, has to come, spiritual training. I often poke fun at my mom's auto harp. I, I still think she just made it up. She found it at some demonic workshop and brought it home and played it and we sang. But I still remember the songs that we sang. And Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And the, the only way I could relate to how he would love me is how my mom loved me. 
my mom had five children. And many of those five children are loud. And they talk a lot and they talk fast. And she spent many years being very busy. Sports, music, dancing, all kinds of things. No, I did not dance. I did not dance. <laughs> um, that would be my sister. But mom always had time. When you needed to talk, she had time. She would make. Oftentimes, we would stand in the kitchen while she was fixing supper, and I would stand over in the corner out of the way and just kind of share with her how my day was going. And she would listen. She didn't say a whole lot, but she was listening. Every once in a while, she, she'd reach out and just kind of rub my shoulder, tell me to get out of the way so she could get a pan, <laughs> give me a task to do, but all the while, she was listening. And that was a difficult place for her to be because I didn't talk much. And I know you go, what? You talk a lot now? I was saving up. <laughs> I was saving up. But mom was saved when I was about six years old. Mom was searching her entire life. <coughs> in her entire life. Started in a Catholic church, went to the Lutheran church went to the Mormon church. I don't know how many of them she was excommunicated from, but I remember when she was excommunicated from the Mormon church, we had to dress up in our little suits and ties. And I was about this tall. And they took us in and sat us out on a pew in the overflow or in the, the vestibule, me and my two brothers and my sister. And they took my mom off and had a talking to and told her that she was no longer part of the church because she had gotten saved. And she realized that the God of this Bible is not the God that that church was teaching. It's not the God in the world of great Christ, the doctrines and covenants. And they told her, you can't come to this church. She said, well, that's fine. I wasn't planning on it anyway. And when we went to a Christian church, we started off in the Church of God, went to a couple of those churches in San Diego and in Denver. And we ended up at a... Yeah, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Can't you tell? Amen. <laughs> Woo. Wow. Man, I should chicken walk. Yeah, they do that right. <clears throat> when I was about five years old, we were on the base. My dad was in the Navy. We were on the base, and we were driving through. <clears throat> there was a building off to the side, and I, I loved looking at that building. And uh, I asked my mom, what, what, what is that building over there? She said, well, that's the chapel. I said, well, what's a chapel? She said, well, that's where they hold church services. And I, I could see the people walking back and forth there. And I told her then, five years old, I wanted to be a preacher. I wanted to be a pastor. Now, from that point to my senior year in high school, I don't know what happened, but I, that, I lost that. But I believe at five years old, God was speaking my future. And he took that, he planted it deep in my mother's heart. And he made her never forget. And she made me never forget. <laughs> my senior year in high school, man, I am I'm gonna be the first Van Note to be an officer in any branch of the military. Better yet, I'm going to be the first band note to be in the best branch, the Navy, and I'm going to be an officer, and my brothers are going to have to salute me. <laughs> <laughs> God said, no. I couldn't, I couldn't join. And my, my other alternative, I had a, a scholarship uh, to see you in Boulder for music. And... Uh, a minuscule scholarship to a church in Bethany, Oklahoma. And God led me to a church in Bethany, or a, a college in Bethany, Oklahoma to learn to be a pastor. Now, um, one of the first things I learned in graduating Bible college 
Uh, we were working at a youth center over here in Victor. We'd only been there about a week. And one of the kids came in and said, uh, Mr. Van Hope. Yeah? Eddie's outside. He's got a gun. He wants to kill Kelly. What class do they teach you this in? <laughs> it's not in eschatology. It's not in soteriology. It's not in etiquette. <laughs> I'm rapidly running through every syllabus I could remember. No guns and shooting. I could, ooh. Very quickly, I learned that college can teach you many, many things, but really, it's God that takes you through it. Now, some people say, you don't need college. No, you don't need college. There are some things that college did for me that are an incredible blessing that you guys get to receive from. It taught me to study the Word of God, not just read it at face value, but to dig deep. To look deep, to connect the dots, to see that it is built precept upon precept. My mom never gave that up. Now, I graduated Bible college in 1992. Should have been 1990, but a marriage and three kids kind of slowed things down a little bit. So 1992, I graduated. What year did I become pastor of this church? 2012. 2012. God took me the long way about. And to be honest with you, I look at the number of schools that turn out pastors and put them in churches, and I think they're foolish. Those kids have got to learn about life. They've got to get out and learn about life. Because I look at some of the lessons that God has taught me. You don't learn those but through the school of hard knocks. My mom is still alive today. You guys will get to see her. She will be here next Sunday. Um, so you can stop by and tell her she did a good job or tell her maybe she didn't. <laughs> Yeah. Unfortunately, you will also get to meet all three of my brothers at the same time, together in the same room. Please, God. <laughs> Don't let them blow it. <laughs> you will get to see why I am the way that I am. My mom came to the Lord when I was five or six. And she had a passion for him. She finally found what she was looking for. Now, she had five children and an unsaved husband who wanted nothing to do with church, wanted nothing to do with God. I remember clearly she had started taking us to the Church of God. And um, that was kind of a cool church because they had a children's church that had a puppet show. The only thing I remember is the song, Brush Your Teeth with Santa Flush. <laughs> Obviously, I paid a lot of attention. I remember my father telling my mom he didn't want his children going to church anymore. He wanted them to stay at home. Now, a lot of women would say, oh, absolutely not. They'd raise a stink and a fuss, and they'd cause conflict in the home. My mom said, okay. And every Sunday, she would take us into her bedroom, and we'd sit on the bed, and she'd open the Bible and, and she'd read some passage of scripture and ask us about it. And she'd take out that auto harp and she would start singing songs. And we would sing the songs that we knew. After about three weeks, my dad said, get that out of my house. Take those kids back to church. <laughs> I think God was honoring my mom's faithfulness. I think God was showing to my mom the same protection and care that he showed to Sarah. Because she obeyed her husband who was ungodly. And she did everything she could do to make sure her children knew the word. Just like Lois and Eunice who taught Timothy. They versed him in the scriptures. And then when Paul came to Lystra and started preaching the word, all of a sudden the light bulb went on, click, and Timothy got it. 
because he had the material. And he didn't get it like a lot of the Gentiles of that day that were experiencing something new. He got it with a knowledge that made him immediately useful. Immediately useful. But we know it was his mom and his grandma that taught him. And they were blessed because of him. So moms, love your children. Absolutely. Love them enough to train them, to rear them in righteousness. Love them enough to put God before their face every day. Love them enough to expose them to the scriptures. Love them enough to teach them to pray. Let them see you pray. Let them hear you pray. Pray with them. Let them see you worship. Let them see you set aside all the clutter and noise and potentially horrible things that are going on in your life and worship. Teach them who God is. Teach them what he has done. Root them, ground them, establish them in the word. Because when they move out from underneath you and they get out in the world, the world is going to do everything it can to clutter their minds and their lives and they need a sure foundation to stand on. And that is the greatest gift you will give them. Our children were raised in a Christian home. Therefore, they were Christian. So I thought. My kids, I mean, from the time they were born, went to church. They went to Sunday school. They knew the verses. They got the little stars on their chart. Benjamin was 14. He went to creation. We were at this church. Well, I had a 14-year-old, which meant I had a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old and a 10-year-old, 5-year-old. I had to count. And he calls me from creation. And when he left for creation, we were praying for him. He'd gone through a really rough time. And I think... It was the rough time that set him up for what God wanted to do. But he called me up and he said, Dad, I got saved. What the beep are they teaching you out there? <laughs> Where's Trevor? Get him on the phone. I got something to say to him. What are you telling my boy he's not saved for? Boy? I got off the phone. I looked at Christy. I've had bad experiences with my kids in church camp. Okay? And all I needed now was him telling my kids they're not saved. Well, he called me again and said, Dad, I got baptized. <laughs> you got washed. You got dumped. You did not get you. <laughs> so I got off the phone and I told Christy, oh, man, you know, man, I'm talking with that church. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, when, man, they come home and we, we were coming over to pick them up, and man, I'm ready. I'm, I got boat barrels loaded. I'm going to unload on the first leader I see. And the first person I saw was Benjamin. He was unloading the car, and he turned around, and I had to look twice to make sure that was my son. And everything that I was going to say vanished like a mist. Because that was not the boy that got in the car to leave a few days before. So we took him home, and we talked with him. What's going on? And he shared his story. Now, well, Christy and I have a problem. We got four other kids. Are they saved? Family meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we have family meetings. Everybody has their assigned spot, not my chair. <laughs> and the family meetings always start off the same way. 
Your mom has something she wants to say. <laughs> I don't know why she's still surprised. <laughs> then we asked our children, are you saved? I was floored to realize that three of my five children could not give me an answer. Christopher had an answer. He had a time. He knew exactly when it happened. He told us what happened. Okay, Donovan didn't know. Mackenzie didn't know. Thaddeus didn't know. That November, uh, we went out to Promise Keepers. That was our first Promise Keepers here at the church. I think it was the last one we actually went to out in Spokane. And uh, first night, they made an offering. You're not saved. Come down. And man, I had my eyes closed. Somebody knocked me over. <laughs> I opened my eyes from sitting halfway on my, and there was Donovan. Hey, man, he's running. He's flying down to the floor for somebody to pray with him. Okay, God, he's yours. You do what needs to be done. Okay, there's three out of five. There's three out of five, Father. Get the other two. Get them. <laughs> you got to pray that. Because he's the one that saves them. He's the one that draws them. About a year later, we were doing Love and Respect. Donovan and Benjamin were watching the children. They have nicknames for each other. Donovan calls Benjamin the tree hugger. Benjamin calls Donovan the child Nazi. <laughs> because Donovan is... We are going to do arts and crafts for seven and a half minutes. <laughs> no second over, 7.30. Benjamin's like, what do you guys want to do? Let's just play. I'm like, no, 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 structure and order, structure and order. Benjamin's like, <laughs> um, That is absolute proof that chaos will win every time, <laughs> just so you know. They got into a fight that night. And Mackenzie was down there, and she was watching them. You know, the fights were nothing new. Um, I never found out about them until they were done. <laughs> I walked down, and there's a hole in my wall. <laughs> and they had the audacity to kind of giggle and laugh. <laughs> we took care of that, Dad. No, you didn't, because there's still a hole in my wall. <laughs> so they have a fight. Donovan climbs out his bedroom window, which evidently he was prone to do. Who knew? <laughs> and he goes off out into the field and he prays. And Benjamin stays in and, and chaos reigned. <clears throat> but they sure sounded like they were having fun. And after a few minutes, uh, Donovan came back in and he and Benjamin reconciled. And Mackenzie's watching that going, okay, there's, there's something different here. So she went into the bedroom, Donovan went in there and she asked him, what, what was different? Why are you guys different? Uh, a couple weeks before this, they were, she and Kristen were driving down the road and we had laid down some rules that Mackenzie didn't like. And Mackenzie just laid it out for Kristen. She said, what if I don't believe? What if I don't believe all this stuff you guys believe? Kristen said, too bad. It's our house, our rules. <laughs> While you're living in this house, these are the rules. You will abide by them. So she goes into the bedroom with Donovan, and he leads her to the Lord. So another year goes by, and I'm, I'm very convicted about Thaddeus. A lot of you guys probably don't remember. I know some of you that worked in the two- to four-year-old class probably do remember. He was very high-strung, very high-strung. The wind would blow and he'd freak out. Something new would happen and he would freak out. Something old would happen and he would freak out. <laughs> he had a lot of stress. And he and I sat down one day and I just talked to him about salvation. I talked to him about his relationship with God. <coughs> and I told him, I want you to take this and I want you to think about this for a couple of days and then I want you to come back and tell me what you think. And a couple days later, he came up and he said, Dad, I think I need to be saved. And I got to lead my youngest son to the Lord. 
of my five children, he's the only one that I actually got to lead to the Lord. Now, a lot of kids pray, especially if you raise them in church. They have an opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. The church is great at manipulating emotions, especially when you get a group of kids together. But see, I've watched my kids. It might have been emotional in the moment, but there was steadfastness over the years. Not that they were perfect. My kids are not perfect. They do the darndest things sometimes. They struggle. They have areas of sin that they are susceptible to, just like the rest of us. But I see my kids praying for each other. And I see my kids committing themselves to the ministry, committing themselves to reading work, to holding each other accountable for their walks. I see my kids stepping in and sometimes reprimanding me when I get out of line and speaking God's truth to Christy and I when we need to hear it. And I am well pleased with my kids. What, what did I do? Man, I did everything I could to sabotage any chance they had at knowing God. I was a stinker for many years. I'd go to church, put on the face. <laughs> <laughs> That kept people from asking me questions. What are you mad about? I'm not mad. <laughs> we blew a good opportunity. God saved my kids. And to be honest with you, between Christy and I, she had much more to do with their spiritual development than I did. Because for a long time, I was so angry with God. <coughs> I was so frustrated with the disaster of church people. I wanted them to be perfect. I wanted them to do what the, the word said that they were supposed to do. I stood on my high horse and looked down my nose at them. Oh, you guys shouldn't act that way. And Christy was always patient with them, always kind. Man, she always had an ear. Donovan was much like me. He didn't talk a lot. But boy, he would seek Christy out, and they would talk for 40, 45 minutes, an hour. Christopher, every night before he went to bed, he had to line out his next day with Mom. Okay, so what's going on tomorrow? And Christy would go through the day with him. I don't know. He, he's weird. <laughs> Last thing I do before I go to sleep, what are we doing tomorrow? First thing I do when I get up, what do we got on the agenda for today? <laughs> There were hours where I was unconscious in between there and stuff falls out of my head. <laughs> Moms, I want to encourage you. God has placed you as key in your kids' lives. He has entrusted you with his children to rear, to raise, to train in righteousness, to be an example to them of godliness. To show them how God loves them. To correct them when they are off. To establish in their lives a set of priorities which puts God at the apex. I look around the room and I see so many moms in here that are doing that. And I see grandmoms that are doing that now for their grandchildren. And I see, I see some who, whose kids are walking away, and I know their hearts grieve. And I know they are interceding before the throne of God for the salvation and restoration of their children. And God hears your prayers. <coughs> God hears them. And he saves your tears in a bottle. So I want to say to each and every one of you mothers today, Father, I ask that you would bless the moms. Biological adoptees, those who just love on anyone that will come in their reach. Father, I thank you for them. 
I thank you that you have ordained and established motherhood. That, Father, you have created in them something that we as fathers just don't have and can't understand. I ask your blessing on them, Father. Encourage them today. Let them feel your pleasure. Let them know your pleasure in them, Father. I ask God today that as husbands and children, we would honor the mothers in our lives. We would bless them today for all the times that they have blessed us. We thank you for them, Father. In Jesus' name.